Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this uh, February 2nd, 0202, 2022, as it's been pointed out to me several times. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. My guest today is certified hand therapist, Michaelia St. Jakes. Did I say that right, Mick? You did. Yep. So Mick, she goes by Mick, and she has lots of letters after her name. And I'm going to read those, and then she can explain what they are. O-T-R slash L, C-W-C-E, and C-H-T. So what do those mean, Mick? Sure. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. I am registered um, with the National Board of Occupational Therapy. I'm licensed in the state of Vermont. And then the next one, I think, is CWCE. So that's a certified work capacity evaluator. Um, Mm -hmm. That means that I am able to help determine somebody's ability to go back to work after sustaining an injury. Um, if they've had some rehab. And then I newly in the last year have become a certified hand therapist, which is the CHD. That's awesome. Congratulations uh, on that accomplishment. And we'll talk more about that. Just a little bit about Mick's background. Um, She received her bachelor's degree in biology from MCLA down the road, uh, master's in occupational therapy from the Sage Colleges in New York, And then as she mentioned, she earned her CHT certified hand therapist credential from the Hand Therapy Certification Commission last year. And she is a member of the National Board of Certified Occupational Therapists and many other organizations. So we're so excited to to have you here. Let's talk a little bit about just your background before we get into all of your handwork. Uh, Tell us a little bit about where you're from and just uh, what you've experienced in life. Yeah, so um, I grew up in Massachusetts. I still live in Massachusetts. I live in a tiny, tiny town um, called Monroe, Mass. We actually just moved into our house about a year ago that my husband built um, for me and my daughter. So we live up in Monroe. Um, I've been here at the hospital since I graduated from grad school, which was in 2013. So I'm coming up and almost on my 10 year already. Um, I actually was a graduate student here, um, did my field work here, and then loved it so much, uh, took a per diem job to get into the hospital system, and then kind of worked my way up and built a full-time position and have been here ever since. I want to go back to your husband building your house. I mean, you're an occupational therapist. Did you just stand over him and tell him what he was doing correctly and incorrectly? Uh, yeah, a little bit. So he's a machinist by trade, um, and works for an awesome, cool little machine shop in North Adams, Mass. And when we got married, his dad goes, oh, here's uh, 10 acres of land. And I said, oh, this is great, but it's in the middle of nowhere. And <laughs> they asked, it's okay, we'll, we'll build you a house and you'll love it. And um, so over the course of probably five or seven years, he, uh, he cleared all the property, he took a whole bunch of classes to figure out what to do, and he built our house. Wow, yeah. that is just a renaissance, man. That is yeah. that is so cool. Is. All right, and and so then what what got you into occupational therapy? And and then actually, first off, when you give a little description of what occupational therapy is for our listeners. Yeah, so occupational therapy is a really cool holistic um, discipline that can be found in so many different settings. So uh, to become an occupational therapist, usually you need a master's degree, you take a lot of courses in just general science, how the body works, how the brain works, and then um, to put it all together and how to help people recover those aspects after some sort of injury. So some OTs um, work in the community, in our schools, preschools, elementary schools. Some work in the mental health field, so they might might work with somebody with addiction or uh, depression or anxiety. And then I have always worked in a medical setting, um, which is how I ended up here at the hospital. So even in our hospital, our OTs look very different depending on where they work. So Um, You can work with patients after they've had a stroke or an orthopedic surgery, um, a hip replacement, a knee replacement. Um, You know, after you have COVID and you're just really weak, you might see an OT all the way to seeing an OT in our outpatient setting. We work everything from kind of how your brain works and executive functioning. Can you do math? Can you pay bills? Um, To how your upper extremities work. I would say our facility here 
Um, there's there's three of us actually who work at outpatient. We all really focus on kind of how the arms work. So that would be kind of the, it's such a huge umbrella. It's a really cool field because if you ever kind of want to go work somewhere else or do something else or kind of dabble in an area, you can do that. Yeah, I think a lot of us um, um, outside of hospital systems have come across occupational therapists really from, you know, knowing that our kids in schools had seen an yeah. occupational therapist. And uh, so what, did, what, did, what does an occupational therapist do in the school system? Yeah, so actually, um, we at our hospital have two occupational therapists who work for us per diem on the weekends. Um, so I get to talk with them all of the time. And then we have another OT who helps in some of our schools, actually, as well. So OTs in the school can work on some sensory type things. You know, if your kiddos clothes don't feel right for them, they seem like they're high energy and you need to get that, that out, or they seem like they might not be as strong as their peers. Um, there's also a large handwriting and fine motor component for OTs in schools. So they might work on, you know, can they write their name? Can they use their scissors? Can they color within the lines? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll get more into that. Let me go back to the initial question I asked you, and then I kind of uh, jumped over and, and asked about occupational therapy. How did you get involved in occupational therapy or, or just tell us a little bit about your path and your interests? Yeah, so I, um, my mom is an RN, registered nurse, she actually has her doctorate in nursing, so I was kind of always thinking healthcare, kind of thought about nursing. Um, my mom worked night shift with nursing, and so I kind of saw the stressors of that, and I said, okay, I want healthcare, but maybe I want a little bit more flexibility in my career, I'll be honest, so I, I started dabbling in maybe some more specialty areas. I actually did two entire years for speech therapy at UMass Amherst and then realized that that wasn't quite the field I went into. Um, so I ended up going into just straight biology and said, I'm just going to get my biology out of the way and then I'll figure it out. Then I did some observations. Um, I ended up observing a couple different OTs in the school setting, um, in an outpatient, in a nursing home. I also looked at some physician assistant positions and things. And then I hooked up with an OT at an outpatient setting and they were treating uh, pretty severe hand injuries. And I said, oh, that's, that's what I, I'm going to do that. So. So then I'm going to ask this question that I know you get all the time. I'm sure we didn't, we did not talk about this ahead yeah. of time, but what is the difference between that's a okay. physical therapist and an occupational therapist? So I knew when I was coming on this show that it would somehow come up. Um, that is the hardest question ever, ever to explain because we work very closely together. Um, and so the lines kind of get blurred and they, they meld together. Degree wise, very different. Um, the physical therapists have a doctorate in physical therapy, typically, um, and their coursework really goes from head to toe. Um, more into the muscle, the muscle and um, bone structure and all of that aspect of the body. OT initially was founded in mental health and um, oh. kind of has, yeah, they kind of worked their way into the physical medicine rehab way, which is kind of the pathway I mm -hmm. took as well. It's a hard one. Um, you know, okay. depending on where where you are in the state, even in the country, you might end up seeing an OT or a PT for a specific injury. Um, it could go either way. Okay. And yeah. I know here at SPMC, we have both OT and PT and you we all do. work together uh, yeah. sometimes on, on the same patients. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's great. So tell me a little bit about um, the specific hand therapy and, and what you do and maybe even what the training involves. Yeah. So in order to become a certified hand therapist, you have to have 4,000 hours of clinical experience with hands. Um, and then there's a pretty comprehensive test you have to take in order to do that. Um, hand therapy is a very specialized area. So when you start to think about the hand and how many muscles and bones, um, and tendons and arteries and all, you know, everything that's in there, it's pretty complicated. So the, the goal with a certified hand therapist is somebody who has exquisitely studied kind of the shoulder all the way down to your fingertips, which is what I did. And you... And that's what you do. And, and actually yep. at SVMC, um, more recently, we've had a hand surgeon join and Dr. David mm -hmm. Beltry. And, uh, and I'm sure the two of you share patients on a daily basis. 
Yeah. So um, Dr. Veltri actually pushed me a little bit in the kindest of ways and said, I need a certified hand therapist and you sound like you would be a good fit. Have you thought about taking the test? And I said, well, it's been on my, my to-do list. I just, I need some more experience and I really need a doctor to help mentor me um, with that. And he says, I'll do it. Let's, let's get this done. You got to, you got to take the test. So um, with his kind pushing, I, I decided to move forward with it. I actually work in clinic with him every Tuesday. Um, so typically his post-op patients we see together. So on every Tuesday he has, I don't know, eight or so patients and we, he, he sees them and then we start their therapy right away. So we are in very close communication about our patients. That's great. And that kind of explains my next question in part, but how, how are patients referred to you typically? So you have that mechanism when you're working right alongside uh, Dr. Veltri, but what other ways? Yeah. So, um, uh, any kind of, you know, any physician, nurse practitioner or physician assistant can write an order for, usually it's just for a straight occupational therapy. And then they'll write if they think they need a certified hand therapist on top of that. I will say that our OT team here is very close and um, very well educated. So typically we tend to share a lot of our patients. And then if anything complicated comes through, I might do a little extra research on what we should do with them. Um, so I get a lot of referrals from our hospital source, but also from outside of the community. You know, if a patient has gone to see a specialist up at Dartmouth or, you know, over mm. in New York or at Mass, um, and they're looking for a certified hand therapist, if they search for me, they usually get a direct for referral that'll say Mick right on it. That's great. And, and so then yeah. you see these patients and, and how, you know, on average, I know that all cases are different. How many times are you seeing them? Is it a one-time encounter or is it, does it go on for months? What is the usual pattern you see? Yeah, it really depends on the surgery. Um, in the, in the best case scenario, you know, somebody just needs to come see me one time and I teach them everything that they need to do at home. And then they kind of independently do it. Um, you know, certainly patients love that because it, it's less time commitment and, you know, financially easier on them. Um, I would say on average, I usually see my patients probably one time a week for six to eight weeks, I would say is, is probably average, especially if it's a patient who's post-operative. Oh, uh, meaning that they had more involved and I might see them a little bit more. Gotcha. And, and, um, and you mentioned financial, so I'll jump into that one real yeah. quick. Um, is this typically covered by insurance, the work that, that you do? Yeah, it is. Um, occupational therapy is usually covered. We take, as you know, here at the hospital, most insurances. So easy ones rattling off the top of my head, Medicare, Medicaid, um, One Care, Blue Cross Blue Shield, any of those um, workers comp all typically have some level of OT coverage. Right. And then for the audience there who, who may be wondering a bit, um, who don't have experience, there is a good reason that the insurance uh, covers occupational therapy because the outcomes are better when you have, uh, particularly with hand. Boy, hand is yeah. so important for not only for work. Uh, we think about hand in, in most occupations being uh, almost critical, uh, but also just in life. And um, I can tell you personally, just even in my 15 years of emergency medicine, those individuals who have followed through with an OT or a PT program, but we're talking about OT right now, uh, almost invariably have a better outcome than those that for some reason don't follow with the program. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges that you face in your day-to-day -day work, or maybe you could give some examples of difficult situations. Oh boy. Um, I'll be honest, the, the rehab world is pretty relaxed. Um, we're a chill group of people, you know, we have, we have music going and we have a plan. Um, so in general, my work day is, is pretty, pretty easy going um, and it's very enjoyable. Um, I would say some of the things that can be difficult is knowing what the doctor wants. And that's my job to figure it out. So if I get a, an order from a physician that I'm not familiar with, I've never, never worked with them, or I've never seen the surgery they do, it's up to me to figure out what they want me to do. So some phone calls, emails, um, hunting down that surgeon and saying, what, what do you want me to do with this patient so that I can make sure then that the patient's doing everything that they can to get themselves to their goals. Generally pretty yeah, actually, remind me to. 
Yeah, I, I love how you said that that OTs and PTs are pretty chill. You just yeah. are an advertisement for uh, those interested in going into healthcare. Emergency medicines are pretty chill uh, position too. I'll just throw that out there, but maybe not quite as much. We don't usually have music going. I wish we did. Um, let me yeah. just go back and just like for, you know, to try to give the audience uh, who may not have experience just an idea. So just walk me through a typical patient uh, experience. They, they have surgery, for example. Why do they need sure. to see the occupational therapist? What do you do for them? And, and, uh, and I think that'll give a good illustration. Sure. Um, I will give you my favorite scenario because it kind of typically affects our middle-aged male population who have worked with their hands forever. Um, And, you know, I came from a blue collar family, so I just, I really like that population. So there's something called Dupatrins, um, which is people start to get kind of cords on their fingers and it pulls them down and they can't, they can't open it. So unfortunately that's a progressive condition and there is nothing conservatively meaning no exercises, no stretching or anything we can do to make it go away. Um, you do need surgery for the, for that one usually. So patient goes and has surgery. Um, Dr. Veltry does his procedure and then they follow up with me. Um, at that first visit, I check out their wound. I see what it looks like. I take some measurements to see, you know, were we able to get those fingers all the way straight? Or are we still curled in a little bit? And with those measurements, I establish goals with the patient, you know, what do you need to get back to? Oh, I need to use a chop saw. I want to ride my motorcycle. Um, I like to row. We determine all of our goals. And then I start to give you exercises. We also, um, for a lot of hand surgeries, we make splints, um, also called orthosis. Um, It's this really cool material. I don't know if you've ever seen one, Trey. I actually just made one in the hospital and all the nurses were super impressed. They they had never seen it. So it's a low temperature thermoplast um, that we put in a hot water. And then we mold it and then we attach Velcro and straps and um, we can put it in lots of different positions depending on what we need it to do, but it's kind of like a removable cast. So with somebody with a, a hand surgery, usually that's, that's key. So that Dupatrin, they probably get an orthosis. And then we'd set up a plan of care. So I am huge on patient responsibility. So I think that I will teach you what to do. You're going to do it at home and then you're going to come back and see me. And I'm going to give you more stuff to do and I'm going to take away some stuff to do. So um, then I, you know, I might see you once a week for a couple of weeks, call, check in, how you doing? You need to come back and see me. Oh no, I'm good. I'm, I'm back riding my motorcycle. Um, I'll call you if I need you. And then, you know, usually they don't call me, but sometimes six months down the road, they're like, I can ride my motorcycle but my hand's not as strong. What should I do? And then they might come back and see me. That was a great uh, visual. I yeah. see that through. I do know orthosis. I actually send people, especially if they have things like the queer veins, tenosynovitis, mm-hmm. um, yeah. it's much better than just uh, an, you know, an aftermarket splint that's designed to fit everybody under the sun. They you know, I like that you know, specific fit that you can provide to them. Um, you know, through, uh, you know, molding it just to that person. Uh, so that's great. So tell us a little bit about um, the past couple of years and how the pandemic may or may not have affected your work. Uh, it, it affected outpatient rehab, you know, quite a bit in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, just like everyone else, we weren't sure exactly what we should do. You know, should we have our patients come in? Should we do some telehealth? You know, there's some people that we just needed to see in person. I, I had to see the wound. I had to take the stitches out. I had to make a splint. So, you know, we saw we saw some of those people. I did a lot of telehealth where we saw people through a one to one on the screen like this. That was probably my favorite thing that came out of COVID. I, you know, we live in rural Vermont and people don't always want to drive an hour to see us. So um, that telehealth aspect of being able to do it over the computer was really cool. So that was a a positive for us. Um, You know, we saw a shift of people weren't getting as many procedures or surgeries done. So we Mm -hmm. were utilized in some other areas, whether it was, you know, helping out our coworkers in the hospital um, or helping out with some more administrative stuff. Um, We, you know, for a little bit there, we were kind of just helping in where we could. Um, And then now I would say, since things are lightening up a little bit, we're, we're full bore. I mean, everyone's catching up. They're like, Oh, I, I got to get this hand done. And, you know, an interesting thing too, while I'm talking about that is a lot of people picked up new hobbies. Um, and 
weren't fully prepared for them. So now people are coming in and they're like, you know, I started working out all the time and now I, my, my wrist hurts like this. And, you know, we look at their routine or say, well, you're not quite doing it right. Let's refine that. Or somebody right. new uh, started working from home all the time. You know, people were used to being in office and now they're at home working on their laptops. So we got a lot of work injuries. Um, following COVID, but it was an interesting thing, you know, a little bit slow, then a little bit of helping everywhere. And now it's super busy. Are you doing any um, telehealth visits anymore, telemedicine visits, or is it mostly gone back to in-person? We are mostly back in person um, when somebody might not be able to come in because somebody in their house has COVID or something and they want to continue with their therapy. Uh, we offer telehealth still because we are able to do that. But I would say 95% is still is back into in person. Yeah, that's great. You know, it's, yeah. um, we'll do a whole show on it here sometime, but uh, there are so many advantages of telemedicine, but not yeah. quite to the level that... Um, that we would anticipate because there are so many advantages to in-person interaction. And, uh, you know, I was talking to someone recently and they said, yeah, I think that telemedicine was really cool, but I actually want to leave my house and see you in person sometimes. And I think that's just, you know, that's just human nature. It's society behavior. And, and uh, you know, in inner city, there can be different reasons to do telemedicine and rural areas, different reasons. But I'm glad that, um, that you're still offering it to those yeah. that it makes sense. Yeah. And then, of course, seeing people in person that, uh, that want to be seen. So let's just let's finish up here. And let me just ask you two things. Just tell us a little bit about um, what your personal goals are over the next year or two, and then any professional goals you may have? Yeah, so um, my, my biggest professional goal was to get my CHT. Um, and so for the first time, I'm not studying or preparing for anything. With that, though, there's still, you know, day to day preparations of what do I want to do for my patients, always kind of studying in the background. But it, to be honest, is just to enjoy um, my certification and working with Dr. Veltri and kind of refining what I like to do with all of those patients. So just kind of, you know, living the hand therapy world is, I guess, my, my biggest professional goal right now. Personally, um, I now that I'm not studying, I would like to work out some more and be outside a bit more. And now that I have time to kind of get back into hiking and not so much studying, that's what I would like to do. That's great. Get outside. And also maybe you could put an addition on, on the house now that it's complete and put a gym and a sauna uh, and some other things over there. I could think of a few. That's, that's great. Um, yeah. So, you know, as we close here and people are learning about occupational therapy, if they thought that maybe they need some um, something, they benefit, what's the best way for them to get to you? Is that going through their doctor and getting a referral? Yeah. Definitely. So the first thing is the SBMC website does have some information about what we offer. Um, and that has our contact information. Our front desk is uh, super knowledgeable and can answer so many questions if you're just not sure. And then yes, your um, doctor would need to write an order and we would get you scheduled. That's great. Thank you so much, Mick, for, for coming on the show. Uh, this is Mick St. Jake's from SBMC Outpatient Rehabilitation. I'm also going to thank uh, Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity, and we will see you next week.